Hello everyone, uh, John here. We're down in the workshop today working on a uh, quite an interesting little project. This, uh, if anyone can recognize it, is a Bang & Olsen stereo system way back from the mid 80s. This is the BioCenter 9000. And uh, I don't know if anyone of you, anyone who grew up in the mid 80s, um, these things are pretty cool back then. They're still really cool from a design aspect. Uh, they can still hold their own. Touch screen uh, glass, no buttons, everything's flush. The tape load door slides underneath, so smooth. And same with the CD door. And basically that's what this is. It's a single CD, single tape player stereo with radio. And of course, it's got uh, input for um, record player, a second tape deck, and an auxiliary input as well. Uh, but these were quite the thing back in the day, and uh, not known for the most, you know, spectacular sound, but obviously from a design standpoint, absolutely amazing. And uh, I, I remember my friend's parents had one, and when I was in high school, I was just... Every time I went over to his house, I just oogled over this thing, and uh, I had forgotten about them. Back then, like, yeah, you had to be pretty wealthy. I think these were going for about four grand Canadian. And back in the day, that was a lot of money for a stereo. Um, so I completely forgot about them. And then several years back, we were in the city, and I, I was happened by an electronics repair shop, and I noticed this thing in the uh, window for sale for like a couple hundred bucks. And uh, yeah, I went in to see if it worked, and it was in beautiful shape, as you can see. Obviously, it's used, um, but whoever owned it before took really nice care of it. There's no scratches or anything. And um, yeah, I basically bought it, super happy with it, and uh, it's been working great. We use it as our, as our main stereo up upstairs, uh, play it almost daily, uh, you know, dinner music, whatever. Uh, unfortunately, a few days back, or oh, a couple of weeks ago actually, the CD player stopped working. Um, it plays, but no sound comes out. And I'll just demo this for you here right now. I'll hit CD. And there is a CD in there. So, it's playing. Uh, the fact that it's counting tells me that one, the motor's working, and two, the laser's working. There's just no sound coming out. Um, I thought, well, the amp is shot. But if you play a tape, tape works fine. And I also plugged um, an auxiliary input in, and it works fine too. So only CD doesn't play. So my guess is there's something wrong with the CD player itself. Um, the circuitry that processes the, the CD signal and sends it to the amplifier. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to open this thing up and um, see if we can figure out what might be wrong with it. Uh, these are getting pretty rare and if you can find a working one on eBay, boy, people are asking pretty big coins. So I'd really like to get it working. As a cheap do-it-yourselfer, I'm not going to take it in to get it fixed most likely. Um, but you can also part these out for really good money. I can't believe what people are asking for parts on eBay for these things. But I would really like to get it working again. So we're going to get into the teardown process. If anyone's got one of these things and you want to see how they open up, it's pretty simple. It's hard to find any information online how to actually get into them, but we're going to cover it all. Um, let's start. We're going to start with the front screws. Okay, bear with me. This is going to be a little bit shaky, but I just want to show you the three screws on the front that have to be removed first. They're kind of hidden under here. There's one right, right below the mic port right here. These are all T10 Torx. Okay, and then moving down. Focus. There's another one right here. So it's about in the middle. And then at the other end, um, by the phone jack, there's the third one. So there's three in the front, 
and you have to get those out. There's little brackets. This thing, the whole front actually hinges up. So you'll see, we'll, I'll turn it around to the back and you can see how it hinges up from the back. There's five fasteners, actually six on the back that have to be removed. Okay, so I've turned it around. Um, so the back side is facing us now. We've got those three little torque screws out the, out the front. And um, just like the front, uh, we're looking at a T, T10 um, Torx bit for these ones back here. It's really hard to find any information how to take these apart, but um, it's actually pretty easy once you know the little secrets here. So you just lift up the little cover for the, uh, the AV uh, accessibility. And just like the front, like a lot of things, you'll know what screws to remove with little, there'll be little arrows pointing to them, molded on the plastic or wherever. So, you know, there's a little arrow pointing to this one. And this is pretty slick how this works. So we take this one out. Again, when you're taking these out, either take video so you know which order, which screws go back and where. So we'll put that one out. Now this is cool. This just slides and then lifts out. There's all these little uh, catches on here that go into these little holes. And then once you get that out, um, then you can access all these other screws. And there's what? One, two, three, four, five. Five Torx T10s. So we'll just start on the right side here and move off to the left. show you that screw there, I don't know if you can see it. And these are all the same length by the way. Looks like about uh, M3 by 12, I'm guessing. Sorry about that, M3 by 12. Again, T, uh, T10 Torx head. Now with those removed, this whole thing should just lift up. And, oh, behold, behold the beauty. Behold the beautiness. Look at that. I'm just going to grab, I'm going to pause it and just grab the camera and we'll go over the insides here. It's pretty neat. So, apologies for any shakiness, but this is the inside of a um, Bio Center 9000. Here's the CD player. Um, it's mounted on rubber isolation bushings. Um, power supply. Pretty neat. I'm guessing because a lot of the wiring from the CD um, drive goes to this board. I'm guessing this is the CD board. The CD logic board. Um, this is the tape player on this side. And I can only assume this is the tape, although there's some RF um, modulators here. Might be radio too, maybe tape and radio. Uh, that's for all your AV outs over there. And I imagine the board on on the top half. That's all for the touch uh, the touch panel. Again, 80s electronics. It's pretty cool. It smells good too. I know unless you're an electronics nerd, you won't even get that, but I think everyone who's smelled 80s electronics, it's got that nice PCB smell or whatever. I don't know what it is, the resin they use on the boards, but, um, but yeah, for mid-80s, pretty neat. So, uh, yeah, we'll get, uh, we'll put a disc in and we'll start figuring out if we can get this thing to work. I'm guessing probably the player's shot or some component in the board, but when you're a cheap do-it-yourselfer, you got to try things before you toss them in the trash. 
So now with the unit open, um, I've, I've put a disc in and I've got a tape in and we'll just make sure the tape is still working. Okay, so tape works fine. CD. Make sure it starts playing here. So what's neat is it will still it'll play with the with the top removed. Okay, so no sound with the CD playing, just like before. Ooh, that doesn't look too good. Hold on, Hold on a minute. I've got a little wire strain here. There we go. So first thing to do, like, yeah, it's probably a shock component somewhere, but, um, you know, start fiddling around with the wiring. It's coming from the CD player. You know. This is the CD board, so there's either something wrong in the CD player or on this board, I would think. Oh. Okay. I don't know if you can see that when I press on the board. So that's telling me there's a bad solder joint somewhere on the board. Could be a bad component too. Boy, you just you just gotta graze it. I wonder if that's a connector, but no, when you hit the board it comes on. So it could either be a bad connector, but it also comes on just by putting the slightest pressure on the board. So that's good news. I'm holding pressure on the board. It's staying on. So that's kind of good. Well, it's very good actually. It means we might, this might actually be an easy fix after all. Uh, what I'm going to have to do now is take out this board and we're going to have a look at the back side of it. Um, hopefully we might see something really obvious. Okay, so we've got the circuit board out. Um, kind of surprising that it's actually got a lot of uh, surface, or not a lot, but a fair amount of um, little tiny SMD devices on the back. We've got uh, transistors few transistors, lots of caps, quite a few resistors, and the odd diode. So, you know, for mid-80s, that's uh, kind of unusual. I didn't expect to find little surface mount stuff on this. Um, I've been kind of manipulating the board. I've got my static strap on um, and uh, gloves so I don't, so my hands don't um, create any um, pathways of conductivity between all these traces. I'm suspecting there's a cold solder joint. I was, I was moving the board around and the sound would come on every now and then, but now that I've been doing that for a while, it stopped. But uh, there's another trick you can try. Um, and I found this, I've been playing around with this, this area of the board right here. If I apply heat to it, sound comes back. So we've either got a bad component, when it cools down it goes out again. So I'm suspecting there's probably a cold solder joint in here somewhere. And if it's not a cold solder joint, there's a bad component. The fact that it is heating, or that it's, um, it starts working so quickly after applying heat, kind of tells me that it's not a component on this side of the board because there's not enough time for the heat to migrate up to these components on the, on the top half. 
So I'm guessing there's something in here. I'm going to take it over to the scope and uh, we'll just uh, we'll look at all these things through the uh, rework scope and I'll probably solder them up and we'll see if that might cure it. It'd be nice if that's all it was. Okay, so we're at, uh, we're at the scope here with the soldering iron and uh, yeah, I've, I've I wish I had a camera. I really have to get a camera for this scope. But I have found, I believe these two, there's, you can tell there, there's cracks around them. This is just a little jumper in here, but I'm thinking that's it. There's a few other questionable um, solder joints on here too I'll redo. But I'm pretty sure it's these two right here. Uh, they've definitely got cracks around the uh, solder leads. So we're just going to solder those up real quick. You can tell they, they are they are they were contaminated even. This whole back of this board actually looks really contaminated. I don't know if it um, if it's already gone for rework once, but you can tell somebody's had cleaning agent on it and removed a lot of the um, uh, that uh, resin off the back. So yeah, like I said, there's a few of these that are questionable too. I'm just going to snag these real quick. Okay, so we're back. I've got the board all plugged in. And um, let's see what happens. Play button. Ho ho! It's the first time that's ever happened. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that was the problem. There might have been something in here, but I could definitely see these two solder joints there were they had they had cracks around them so I guess we'll just put this back together and chalk up a fixed um, Bang & Olsen Bio Center 9000 it lives to see another decade hopefully cheers everyone